So in the next session, we're going to have uh, several lectures on the topic of gem characterization. And to start off, we're going to be having a keynote speaker, speaker uh, Dr. Evan Smith, who's going to be discussing some of the research that he's been doing on super deep type 2A and type 2B natural diamonds. Please, let's wel welcome Dr. Smith. Hi. So there's a lot of interest, a lot of excitement surrounding this term type 2. Um, a lot of people who have looked at diamonds through their career um, hold a special place for type 2 diamonds. And just in the past few years really, the past three years, we've learned a lot about how these diamonds form and they actually tell us a lot of surprising things about the earth and how it works. So I have slides. This is my first slide. I have the power to change this. Okay. We're going to be talking about the formation of, of uh, natural type 2 diamonds. So this is a sketch of someone's diamond collection. And the thing I like about it is that you can see there's so many different shapes and sizes and colors. When it comes to natural diamonds, uh, you can start to think about what different mantle processes and mantle storage environments might give rise to all these different characteristics. And in this image, the, so this is a, a book, and the author of the book has sketched out their personal diamond collection. And this person has grouped some of these diamonds together based on their characteristics. So there's lots of different ways you can think about grouping or classifying diamonds. And one of the most popular, well-known classification schemes is the, the type classification scheme. So at its very basic level, you can sort of divide most diamonds down into type 1 and type 2 on the basis of the nitrogen that they contain. So diamonds are a crystal of carbon. They contain carbon atoms linked together and sometimes these atoms can be replaced and the most common thing that replaces them is nitrogen. And when you replace them with nitrogen and you can detect this nitrogen with infrared spectroscopy, then this is a type 1 diamond. Go back. So this is like 99 or 98% of all diamonds. Uh, but on the other side, when we've got very pure diamonds, very pure material, where it's almost all just carbon, this is type 2. Uh, and you can break this down into type 2A, where it's just carbon, and type 2B, where you've actually started to substitute some of the carbons with a different element called boron. And the boron quite often can cause a blue color that's very attractive. And the hope diamond is the perfect example of a type 2B diamond. So these diamonds are of great interest for a gemology perspective uh, because a lot of the, the largest and most famous diamonds in the world actually fit over here in this category. Um, so there are a lot of large D flawless diamonds that are type 2A, uh, but you don't really just have to take my word for it. There are a lot of anecdotal um, claims of, of this, but you can see this in the data. So here's um, diamonds and their color. So this is a sample set of three and a half million diamonds. And we're looking at colors. So these are the, the GIA color scale. So D is perfectly colorless. And as you go down through the alphabet, you, st you usually get uh, yellows and, and brownish kind of hues being added in there. So if we just look at perfectly colorless diamonds, D compared to E, the next best color grade, and make that into a ratio. That's what's shown here on the vertical axis. And we have all these diamonds split up according to size. So there's the smaller size range and the larger size range. And for the smaller diamonds, you know, one, two, three carats, um, the proportion of D color diamonds remains about constant. It's fairly low. And then as you get above 5 or 10, 20 carats, the proportion of D color, perfectly colorless diamonds, skyrockets. So a lot of these large diamonds are D color. And that's a very surprising thing to see just explode out of the data like this. And the reason, as you're probably guessing, is having to do with this idea of type 2s. 
So here's the same set of 3.5 million diamonds, and the whole set, you've got about 1.3% that are type 2. Uh, but if we look at the largest 1,000, largest 500, 100, or largest 50 diamonds in that population, the proportion of type 2 goes way up, almost reaching 50%. So when you look at very large diamonds, there's this very unusual tendency to have a pronounced proportion of D colors and type 2 diamonds. And if we take this group of of 1,000 largest diamonds, and now look at the clarity of those diamonds. This is what we see. So we've divided that 1,000 largest diamonds into type 1s and type 2s now, and there's a very dramatic uh, relationship here. You can see type 2s are heavily skewed over towards the flawless end. So type 2 diamonds actually have a remarkably uh, lower inclusion content in them. So they're quite often inclusion free. They have very few inclusions in them compared to uh, type 1 diamonds of comparable size. So type 2 diamonds in the data, they stand out. And in actual samples, famous samples, type 2 diamonds really stand out. So even though only about 1% or 2% of all diamonds fit into this category of having very low nitrogen. It's a very interesting uh, population. And we know that a lot of large D color flawless diamonds like the Cullinan, these are almost always type 2A. And when you look at many of the world's most valuable and most famous diamonds, these are type 2As or their cousins, type 2Bs, containing some boron like the Hope Diamond. So from an earth science perspective, these diamonds also stand out. And there have been many questions asked over the years about these diamonds. Do they form in a special way? Is there a special recipe that the earth has to make diamonds like these? Are they really different in their formation in nature? So to sort of begin this discussion, we should look at how most diamonds form. So in general, how diamonds form. Well, what we know about diamond formation, a lot of it comes from studying inclusions. Inclusions provide a lot of information about the place where diamonds grow. So if you can imagine somewhere deep in the earth, in the mantle, you've got a small diamond growing, and as it grows, it might envelop some material from surrounding that diamond. It can include some mineral grain. And then when that diamond gets transported to surface, say in a kimberlite eruption, that mineral grain can be very well preserved. So you have some piece of the mantle that, that's sort of a snapshot of the, the place, the real environment of diamond growth. That conveys a lot of information about where diamonds come from and how they're actually growing. So based on inclusions, we know that most diamonds form in the base of the oldest, thickest parts of continents at a depth of about 150 to 200 kilometers down in the Earth. And they're brought to surface in volcanic eruptions, quite often one called kimberlite. So they actually bring diamonds to surface where we might find them and actually mine diamonds commercially. So the other thing we know from diamonds and their inclusions is that there are multiple different ways that diamonds can form. So there's not just one way that diamonds form in nature. There are multiple different ways. Now, we said a lot of diamonds form in the base of the continental lithosphere, in the thickest, oldest parts here. Uh, but when it comes to these large type 2A and type 2B diamonds, it, how they fit into this picture, this sort of uh, model that we have of the Earth, has remained completely unknown for many years. And there's a couple good reasons for that. The rarity and high value of those diamonds makes them very difficult to access for research. But then if you do manage to borrow the crown jewels for a weekend or something like that, quite often these diamonds rarely contain inclusions. So you've got really almost nothing to work with because you've got no inclusions that sample the place where this diamond grew. Now, they rarely contain inclusions, but rarely is not never. Uh, and what we've seen a few cases of is reports that sometimes these type 2 diamonds contain these black inclusions, these sort of flaky looking um, black things. Uh, but like I said, it's difficult to access these for research. So it, there really isn't much until very recently uh, of people being able to look at these inclusions and, and see what they are. So that's exactly what I've done. I've 
gone on a sort of quest to find these inclusions that have been reported here and there and see what they are and see what they tell us. So this is the search for inclusions. So what I've done in the past few years is to look for any examples of type 2A and type 2B diamonds with inclusions. And the way I've been able to attack this problem is by using the grading infrastructure at GIA. So lots and lots of diamonds come through GIA's operations for grading. And this is an immense resource for earth sciences because it allows you to see some of these diamonds that otherwise would be so rare that you'd never encounter them in your lifetime. So I've borrowed diamonds from the GIA grading operations. And also, through some of our connections, we've been able to obtain offcuts, which are, are pieces trimmed off of larger diamonds. And sometimes those are the more heavily flawed regions that contain the inclusions of interest. So to date, I've examined 83 type 2A and 46 type 2B diamonds. And I've looked at the inclusions primarily using a technique called Raman spectroscopy, but also for some samples, we've had the opportunity to use more advanced techniques like X-ray diffraction and electron microprobe. And the results so far have been really powerful. They've unraveled the geological origin of diamonds like this. And we've had three uh, cover stories sort of detailing uh, all the stuff that we've found. And that's what I'd like to tell you about today. Uh, but before we really begin any meaningful discussion about diamonds like this, uh, we have to sort of refine our terminology slightly. So these are what most people think of when you say type two diamonds. So you've got these large diamonds, they're very irregular in their morphology, they're inclusion poor, and their textures in the surfaces are usually heavily resorbed or chemically rounded and kind of dissolved. Uh, but we know that there are some examples of diamonds that contain very little nitrogen and are technically type two, but don't really fit into this category very nicely. For instance, micro diamonds, some that are you know, half a millimeter. You don't see them in the gem trade, but a lot of those technically are type two. So to have a meaningful discussion about these diamonds specifically, it's necessary to capture all of these features together to have, uh, well really to have a term to recognize these as a distinct variety. So the term we have is clipper. This is a acronym that captures all of these unique properties. So the C is for Cullinan-like. So this is the perfect example of diamonds like this, the largest gem diamond ever found. And the largest one cut from that is the Cullinan one. So diamonds that are similar to this, that are Cullinan-like, they tend to be large, they tend to be inclusion poor, they're very pure, so they're almost always, but not necessarily exclusively, type 2A. They're irregular in their shape and they're very resorbed. So diamonds like this one, uh, now to have a real discussion in detail about them, we'll be referring to them as clipper diamonds. So this is a 404 karat diamond from Angola. And now I'm gonna show you what diamonds like this contain in terms of inclusions. So I studied 83 diamonds like this and the most common thing they in include is this stuff. These are actually what I would call metallic inclusions. So this is a, a view under a microscope, but if you imagine if you just had this in, a, uh, in your hand, or you had a, a loop to check this out, what you would see is this sort of big black flaky looking kind of spot. So this is a graphitic fracture around the inclusion itself. And the inclusion itself is kind of harder to spot, but this is it here. This is the real inclusion volume that has been trapped. And it's metallic in its luster, but it's also metallic in its composition as well. So we've seen lots of examples of that. And overall, there are about 70% of the samples that I looked at containing this metallic um, kind of inclusion. So this is the most common kind of inclusion in clipper diamonds. And if you take a sort of a cross section through one of those metallic inclusions to see what it looks like inside, this is what they look like inside. So this is, uh, these are false colors, so they don't look brilliantly colored, but these are uh, colors that correspond to the composition. So this is under an electron microscope, and we can see uh, what are highlighted here are iron, nickel, and sulfur. So you'll see that this is multiple phases. We've got in bright green, there's an iron carbide phase in this sort of pink color. This is where the nickel is hiding. This is an iron nickel alloy. And then the turquoise color, that's where the sulfur is. This is an iron sulfide phase called pyrotite. So it's a mixture of all these different elements. So it's got a lot of metallic iron and nickel. 
And if you think about this inclusion, if you were to put it back into the mantle, raise the temperature and pressure back up to mantle conditions, this mixture would actually melt. Um, so this was most, almost definitely trapped as a melt. So this was originally trapped as sort of a, a liquid phase, molten metal. And because of that, the implication is probably that these diamonds crystallized from this melt. This actually very likely represents the growth medium for these diamonds. So they have an intimate relationship with metallic iron, and it looks like the metallic iron is the growth medium. And they contain some other inclusions too. So although 70% of them contain metallic iron, you've also got a mixture of some other inclusions in there particularly high pressure silicate inclusion. So I saw 23 diamonds that contain majoritic garnet uh, and or this calcium silicate perovskite phase, or really what you observe is what that breaks down to at lower pressures. And these are minerals that only form at extreme pressures, very, very deep in the earth. And you can actually bracket the, the depth of formation to being at least 360 kilometers deep and maybe even as deep as 750 kilometers for these diamonds. So remember I say most diamonds formed about 150 or 200 kilometers deep. So these actually form three, four, maybe even five times deeper than most diamonds in a completely different part of the mantle. So clipper diamonds are in fact super deep diamonds. They qualify as being super deep. They form very deep in the earth. Now, the metal that's included, those most common inclusions, is actually very important on a sort of broad earth science scale because experiments and theory have predicted that there should be metal, metallic iron, very deep in the earth, very deep in the mantle, as a result of this thing called iron disproportionation. So we know from doing experiments and by doing sort of calculations that the rocks down here, deeper in the mantle than about 250 kilometers, this space, purely by virtue of the high pressures, some of the iron included in those minerals should exsolve almost like uh, oil and water. You should have little tiny droplets of metallic iron in this environment. And that's what we see predicted from experiments and theory. And it really looks like the clipper diamonds and their inclusions are providing a sort of real sample of that. And they help to confirm this idea that you have a little bit of metallic iron in here, maybe upwards of one weight percent at maximum. So just a small peppering of metallic iron. And this has big implications for the behavior of Earth's interior. You probably are familiar with the idea that metallic iron will tend to rust. Iron likes to react with oxygen, and something similar probably happens deeper in the Earth. So this, this metal budget has implications for what can happen with oxygen. This in turn reflects um, what can happen with the rocks when they're melting. And more broadly, this impacts the physical and chemical evolution of the mantle, the Earth, through time. So we'll take a slight tangent here. Uh, on some of these metallic inclusions. So I was showing you metallic inclusions that are very well sealed inside the diamond. They're trapped, they're preserved. But some inclusions have a, a bit of a crack, a crack that reaches the inclusion. So you can imagine here this crack reaching into the diamond and it intersects that inclusion. So now it's more of an open environment. You could potentially have air or fluid entering that crack and interacting with that metallic inclusion. When you do that, the minerals inside it can change. So here's an inclusion that has actually been affected in this way, and it was probably interacting with some of the volcanic fluids on its way to surface. And you can see that a lot of the iron inside it has oxidized. You have a mixture of iron oxides and some other phases. But interestingly, this pale phase here, this is a nickel sulfide. And when you look at more detail, the crystal structure of this nickel sulfide is actually a hexagonal crystal structure that's equivalent to the synthetic phase known as alpha nickel sulfide. And this is something that's actually never been seen before in nature. So because of that, it's never been seen before, now we have an example that we know is natural, and if you characterize it, at this point we've actually had the official confirmation that we can declare this a, a new mineral species, and we've chosen to name it after uh, Robert Crowning Shield. So this gentleman here, who was a pioneering figure in GIA, and laid a lot of the framework for the research that we do now. So he dedicated more than 50 years to GIA research. 
So this means that now we have two prominent figures, historical figures in GIA research, and both of them are recognized by having a mineral named after them. So I think this is a nice way to recognize their legacy and the, the real structure that they've built into GIA and the appreciation for research. So now back on track with the, the diamonds themselves, we're going to revisit the Hope Diamond here. So this is type 2B diamonds. And the story is similar to what we saw in the Clipper diamonds, those type 2A diamonds. Uh, but remember, these ones are characterized by the presence of boron. Quite often, the boron might reach up to one or maybe even as high as 10 ppm boron. And this is enough to impart this attractive blue color that we see. And even though less than 1% of all diamonds in the world are type 2B, there's still something you find quite a wide range of localities across the world. So it's something that you see recurring geologically. And it's very interesting from a geologist's perspective because of this boron. Boron has a real significance in earth science because boron is extremely enriched at the surface of the earth. It's something that concentrates heavily into melt. Whenever you melt part of the earth and form the crust, for instance, the boron will partition into that melt. And also any water at the surface of the earth will have an even further tendency to take up that boron and reconcentrate it. So the surface of the earth is heavily concentrated with boron. It's got lots of boron. And in contrast, there's very little boron deeper in the earth in the mantle. So the fact that you have these diamonds that are characterized by boron is unusual. It's unusual to find boron as a defining purity in a diamond because we know diamonds come from the mantle, a place where there's very little boron. So there's always been questions about the source and the significance of this boron. That's why these diamonds are of a special interest. So as I mentioned, I, I looked at 46 type 2B diamonds specifically with inclusions. And initially the thing that I noticed is there were very few, inclu few inclusions that were of that metallic variety. Uh, and in contrast, they have a slightly different mixture of inclusions that dominated by uh, this calcium silicate phase that we saw before, but now it's even more prominent. This calcium silicate perovskite that breaks down into other calcium silicate phases that you can actually measure. And there are some other inclusions here. Uh, examples of something called Bridgmanite, Stichovite, a CF type phase, which is uh, short for calcium ferrite type phase, something called ferropericlase, and majoritic garnet. And I'll draw your attention to just a few of those in, in this slide. Uh, actually, we're, we're going to take a very close look at Bridgmanite, because Bridgmanite is a very important indicator of depth. Bridgmanite is something you only form in the lower mantle, deeper than about 660 kilometers or 400 miles. Um, so a key thing that you have to keep in mind when you're examining these minerals is that these high pressure minerals often sort of decompose. And when you bring them up to surface, they're usually no longer stable. And sometimes they break down into a lower pressure phase. Sometimes they unmix and you end up with a, a sort of a composite inclusion with one or two or three different minerals in it. Um, so this is something that you have to sort of piece back together, but I've identified uh, former Bridgmanite in 16 samples. So in four cases, this occurs as this mineral orthopyroxene, which is the same composition of Bridgmanite, but it's a different crystal structure. And in 12 cases, uh, you get inclusions that have more aluminum in them. And this is the troublesome thing, because the aluminum tends to break out as another mineral phase. Quite often, you can form Jeffbenite or Spinel. These are things that contain the aluminum, because the lower pressure phases, the orthopyroxene has a hard time taking up that aluminum. So this inclusion down here, all of this colorless material, I'll point it out for this audience over here. This inclusion down here, you've got all this colorless material and then you've got this black thing here. So these are actually two different minerals stuck together. Um, this was one single mineral phase of Bridgmanite when it was trapped, but now it's unmixed. Um, but we can piece this back together. Anyway, so this is just to give you an example of sometimes the challenges of putting the story back together and seeing what this was originally when it was trapped. But the sort of assemblage that we see, um, I think we can highlight some of it and put it on this diagram here. This is a complicated looking diagram, uh, but I'll walk you through it. So what this is sort of representing is the minerals that make up one particular kind of rock that is the most important rock type in the ocean crust. So the ocean crust 
is here, at the top of the oceanic lithosphere. So that at the ocean floor, you've got the ocean crust. And as you take this ocean crust, that's usually a rock type called basalt, as you take that deeper into the Earth by virtue of plate tectonics, so you can imagine this, this whole slab of material is slowly descending deep into the Earth. As the crust gets pushed deeper and deeper into the Earth, the pressure and temperature change, and the minerals making up that rock change as well. So at a depth maybe up here, that rock type is made up of garnet and clinopyroxene, it's two minerals, but as you go deeper and deeper into the Earth, those rocks change even more. You end up with only this red phase, this majoritic garnet phase, maybe a little bit of this white phase here, which is stichovite. By the time you take that slab all the way down to the lower mantle, the minerals change all together, and you end up with this assemblage of minerals here. And I've highlighted this because this is everything that you see in type 2b diamonds. So there are a couple others that don't fit into here, but these are the most important ones I want to draw your attention to. The point is that the mineral inclusions we see tell us very clearly that these diamonds formed in rocks that represent the ocean floor, this whole ocean lithospheric slab, but after it's been brought to the depth of the lower mantle, or maybe even partly the transition zone, but very, very deep in the earth. So this is a very important idea when it comes to interpreting the source and significance of the boron. Remember, type 2b diamonds are characterized by the boron. Type 2b, boron, they go hand in hand. And remember, the Earth's surface is very boron rich, but the mantle has very little boron. So the fact that the rocks where this diamond is growing, those rocks look like they used to be at the surface of the Earth, that lends itself to this idea that maybe the boron is actually derived from the surface of the Earth, and it's hitchhiked down into the Earth along with this sort of subducting plate of, of oceanic lithosphere. So this is put together in this genetic model. This is something that we put in a paper recently. And the idea here in this genetic model for how you make a type 2b diamond, this is what it looks like. So this sort of system of plate tectonics. So uh, plate tectonics is a theory you've probably heard about the Earth's surface being made up of plates. And quite often along plate boundaries, when they rub together, you get earthquakes and things like that. So there are sort of two kinds of plates. There's the continental lithosphere where we live, and then underneath the, the world's oceans, you've got a different kind of plate called the oceanic lithosphere. Uh, and the rock type is slightly different, and it's not long for this world. The floor of the ocean is sort of in this continuous, perilous cycle of, of diving down into the earth, something called subduction. So nowhere on the earth is the ocean floor older than about 200 million years, which is not particularly old in the geological time scale. So it's very normal that the ocean floor is sort of continuously, almost like a conveyor belt, being subducted into the earth. So this is a, an important idea sort of underpinning this whole model. So let's take a look at this. So plate tectonics um, provides the framework whereby the ocean plate might carry boron deep into the mantle. So over here at number one, something that's happening in this model is that the seafloor, seafloor alteration is putting boron into the ocean rock. So the water is actually interacting with the rocks here and you have uh, the possibility of forming some new minerals that now lock up that boron. And now when this whole plate is subducted through the normal action of plate tectonics, you have the capability of holding on to some of that boron. A lot of it will be lost here in this little tiny volcano here. So this is uh, sort of stripping off a lot of water and stripping off a lot of the boron that's contained. But there is the possibility that you could contain some of that boron mineralogically in something called DHMS, these dense hydrous magnesium silicates. So if you can do that, then you have a mineralogical bridge that allows you to take boron and hold on to it for a little bit longer. So the idea is that you've got boron trapped into this plate, you can take it down, you can preserve it under special cooler conditions where the temperature maybe doesn't get too hot, and you can take that boron all the way down here. Eventually what happens is that those boron bearing minerals become unstable at some extreme depth. So that DHMS that I mentioned eventually is going to break down. So it looks like a lot of the phases that we know that our DHMS should break down approximately at the depth corresponding with the top of the lower mantle. 
when those phases break down, they're going to release their boron, and they're going to release the, they actually contain some water with them. So it's almost like a hydrous fluid that you can imagine being released when this phase breaks down. And then, at that point, you've got boron-rich fluid being released, and the idea is that this fluid, like a lot of diamonds, fluid is something that can trigger diamond growth. Most diamonds are thought to grow from some kind of a fluid or a melt, and in this case, we've got something with a lot of boron in it. It's uniquely boron-enriched, and it's this fluid that's triggering type 2B diamond growth. So that's, the, that's the, sort of the new model that's put out there. So. What have we learned so far by looking at these larger diamonds? So by this overview of, of diamonds that are normally difficult to come by if you're in a university, uh, by virtue of having the connections and the, the whole infrastructure of GIA, we've been able to look at these uh, clipper diamonds, which are sort of what you might typically think of as type 2A diamonds, type 2B diamonds, we've learned that they're super deep diamonds. And this is something that sort of refuted the whole notion that super deep diamonds are always small and very inferior quality. Until we made this study, there really wasn't any evidence of super deep diamonds making it into the gem trade at all. They weren't really thought of as a significant component of the, the marketplace of gemstones. So we've seen that actually maybe as much as 1% maybe of diamonds are actually super deep diamonds. They're coming from, say, three or four, maybe even five times deeper in the earth than most other diamonds. And this is a completely different geological recipe that's making these diamonds. So, and then we've seen two important sort of broad things that we've learned. One is that those clipper diamonds, by virtue of their metallic inclusions, they're telling us that the deep mantle probably contains metallic iron, something we've predicted, and now we can confirm with real physical samples. And the other thing we've learned from the type 2B diamonds is that boron may be carried from the surface of the Earth, actually carried by the action of plate tectonics deep into the Earth. This is something that we don't have a lot of evidence for otherwise, that we're always searching for ways that things from the surface of the Earth might get recycled deep into the Earth. So it looks like type 2B diamonds speak to this notion of recycling of surficial materials deep into the Earth. And the last thing, that I, I want you to take away from this presentation is that diamonds really, I mean, in addition to being beautiful pieces of jewelry, uh, diamonds are beautiful gemstones. They're my favorite mineral, but they're also some of the most valuable samples of our planet from a scientific perspective. There's really no other mineral that can trap and preserve materials and come to the surface of the earth the way diamonds do. So I think diamonds have this sort of dual value as a, as a beautiful gemstone and it's by coincidence that they're also this immensely valuable piece of, of science. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Evan. That was a beautiful talk. If we can take some questions. One thing that I don't understand yet, Evan, is what happened to the nitrogen? Do you have any suggestion why there is no nitrogen in the, these diamonds? Yeah, so the question is why is there no nitrogen? Why are these uh, belonging to this very nitrogen poor category? And I think that's still a question that could be interpreted further. My interpretation that I've put forth in a couple of these papers is that because you've got a lot of metallic iron in this extreme depth, the metallic iron will have a strong tendency to absorb nitrogen. So in general, this should be a place where it's very difficult to access nitrogen for a growing diamond. There's something else competing for nitrogen. And beyond that, you might also have the scenario where the fluids making it to that depth simply don't have as much nitrogen to begin with. So I think there are a few different ideas that you could put out there. My preferred one is that the, the metallic iron makes it difficult to access nitrogen because it's taking it up. Yes, please. Could subduction also be a carbon source for these deep diamonds? Yes, absolutely. So the question is, 
could subduction be a carbon source for these diamonds? And that's actually something I didn't put into this talk because it, it takes more time to explain. But we have evidence from carbon isotopes. The carbon isotopes in these large diamonds, both the, the clipper diamonds and the type 2b diamonds, they have this sort of broad range of carbon isotopes that's, that sort of spans out into the lighter carbon isotopes that we typically associate with the source, or source of carbon being surficial, sort of subducted carbon. Yes? Uh, yes, have you by any chance had the opportunity to see any of the graphitized diamonds from southern Spain here brought back? Um, they believe that these are perhaps the oldest diamonds known, and they are reported to come from super deep. Okay, so the question is about these, these diamonds from southern Spain. I think these are, um, quite often they're, they're graphitized. So you just see like a, an octahedral shape that's all graphite. It looks like it used to be a diamond. Yeah, I'm not overly familiar with these kinds of diamonds, but I think they come from a slightly different geological picture because they're not hosted in a, a volcanic deposit. They're hosted in sort of ultramafic rocks quite often, like a, a massif. And yeah, and, and this is sort of a different geological picture, and I think there hasn't been uh, a whole in-depth analysis of exactly how those diamonds form. What I know about them is that the, I think the leading theory is that you've had some kind of subduction process that's carried carbon-bearing um, rocks deep into the earth, diamonds have formed, and that mass of material has been popped back up the subduction zone into a, where, where we now find it in a mountain belt. Um, so the rocks have sort of been squished back up rather than exploded back up by a volcano. But I think that's a, it's a different kind of story and it's going to require uh, maybe another look. I think there's more to find out there. I, I'm always open for a trip to the field. Yeah. I'll see what I can do, but I have to go with you. Okay. Nice meeting you. Yeah, we'll talk later. All right, thank you very much, Evan.